Hello everyone and welcome to this short research methods lesson on correlations. Now the way this is going to work is very simple. I'm going to give you a few little introductory points into what correlations are and how they work. But honestly, a lot of it shouldn't be new to you because you will have come across it um, in other topics in psychology already. Um, we're then going to move on to a few little examples and a few of the more nitty gritty points before looking at some evaluation points and some possible exam questions. OK, so correlations are a type of research method that illustrate the nature of an association between two covariables. OK, so what that means essentially is that it looks at if there is a link or a relationship between two things. OK, um, it looks at what that link is and it also looks at how strong that link is. Typically, correlations are plotted on a scattergram. It looks a little bit like this. OK, it's important that you know what this is because it's very common um, to ask people in an exam to draw a scattergram. Um, when you're drawing a scattergram, you plot your covariables on each axis. So in this case, you are looking at the relationship between a wife's age and a husband's age. And as you can see, the wife's age gets plotted on the Y axis and the husband's age gets plotted on the X axis. But it doesn't really matter. You could switch those around if you wanted to. Each one of the blue dots is a participant or is a pair of participants in this case. OK. The strength of a correlation is indicated by what's known as a correlation coefficient. OK, so that's um, always designated by the letter R and the correlation coefficient ranges from minus one to plus one. OK, um, minus one is a perfect negative correlation and plus one is a perfect positive correlation. And we'll come on to what that means in a sec. OK, so like I said before, you have two types of correlation. You've got positive correlations and you have negative correlations. You've also got no correlation, but that's not really a type of correlation. So your positive correlation, you can see on the left hand side there, um, that essentially is as one variable increases, so does the other. So, for example, caffeine and anxiety, as the amount of caffeine that you drink increases, so does the level of anxiety that you experience. You've also got a negative correlation, which means that as one variable increases, the other one decreases. So the example there would be that as the amount of caffeine that you drink increases, the amount that you sleep decreases. OK, and then obviously no correlation means there's no relationship at all. Um, in terms of your correlation coefficients, um, this is what I was saying before. So the positive correlation on the left there, you could say that that's a pretty much perfect correlation. So um, R would be plus one. Um, and the one in the middle, you've got a pretty much perfect negative correlation. So R would be minus one. Um, and for the no correlation, R would be zero. OK, and R is the letter that we use for the correlation coefficient. So I've just got a few more examples for you there. Part of the mathematical requirement in A-level psychology is being able to estimate results. So it's not unheard of for students to be given a scattergram with the results of a correlational study and then being asked to estimate the correlation coefficient. OK, so obviously in uh, the previous slide, you saw a pretty much perfect correlation. Um, but they're not always going to be like that. So it's important that you realize what the difference is between a perfect correlation and let's say a correlation of 0.3 where it's far from perfect and the points on the scattergram are more spread out. OK, so you've got 0.7 on the left, which is fairly decent, but not perfect. 0.3 in the middle, which is quite spread out and quite far from perfect and then zero on the right where there's just nothing there. OK, so being able to see the difference in those and make a judgment call as to how good and how strong the correlation is, is something that you're going to need to be able to do. OK, so the final bit before we move on to the evaluation points is just making sure that everybody is clear on the difference between a correlation and an experiment, because a correlation is what's known as a non-experimental method. 
experiments have IVs and DVs. And having an IV and a DV means that we can infer causality. OK, so we can say the change in the DV was brought about by the manipulation of the IV. But correlations don't have any manipulation of variables. They don't have IVs and DVs, which means that it's not possible to infer any kind of causality. Because of that, you've always got to consider third party variables. You've always got to consider intervening variables, variables that you're not studying, but could have an effect on the variables that you are studying. An example of that comes from the social influence topic. So in the social influence topic, um, there is research support for the authoritarian personality, which was provided by Elms and Milgram. They found that people who scored highly on the F scale were also more likely to be obedient in Milgram's research. However, that finding is only correlational because there are other variables that could have caused that level of obedience. For example, education levels. So there was also this argument that low levels of education could have also brought about high levels of obedience in Milgram's research. OK, so the relationship between scores on the F scale and obedience in this case was only correlational and there were other factors that had to be taken into consideration. OK, correlation does not mean causation. OK, there's always the possibility of an intervening variable. So that's the end of the outline already. Um, we'll now move on to a couple of evaluation points. They're very, very short because, you know, this is a research methods topic and so they don't tend to go into too much detail. Um, try and remember as many as you can. Um, I can't see you ever needing more than three for any kind of evaluation question that comes up in a research method section. But just to be safe, I would try and remember two strengths and two limitations. So we'll start with strengths. Um, a good thing about correlations is that they are a good preliminary tool. OK, so um, assessing the strength of a relationship or the strength and the, more importantly, the direction of a relationship could suggest ideas for future research. OK, so if you do a correlation and you find that there is a strong relationship between two variables, or your results throw up some kind of interesting pattern, then you might want to dig into that a little bit more. OK, so correlations very often provide a good starting point um, for research um, and people often conduct them before committing to long term research okay? because you can do them quickly. And, you know, if there's nothing there, then you don't need to invest any more time. And then, like I just kind of alluded to, they are quick and easy to carry out. OK, there's no need for a controlled environment like a lab. There's no manipulation of variables. Um, it's simple. You could even use secondary data. So secondary data is data that's been collected by somebody else for a different purpose, like um, government statistics or government surveys and that kind of thing. You could even use those. Um, for your correlation. So you don't even need to uh, to collect your own data, which make correlational research even less time consuming. OK, so it's very economical. It's very quick and easy to carry out. So moving on to limitations, there are three that I'm going to show you. The first one is the fact that it can only tell us how variables are related, but not why they're related. OK, and that's due to the lack of experimental manipulation and control within a correlational study. Um, because they can't demonstrate cause and effect, we also can't be sure which variable is actually causing the other variable to change, um, which means we also have an issue with the direction of causality. So as an example, um, caffeine and anxiety are positively correlated. Um, however, we don't know whether an increase in caffeine causes an increase in anxiety or whether it's the fact that already anxious people tend to drink more coffee. Okay, so we don't know which 
of the two it is. Okay, so we've got a problem with the direction of causality. You've also got what's known as the third variable problem. We talked about this briefly earlier. So again, if we stick with the anxiety and caffeine issue, um, a third variable could be a high pressure job. So you could say somebody in a high pressure job experiences more anxiety and therefore drinks more caffeine. Or you could say somebody in a high pressure job um, drinks more caffeine to keep up with the long working hours. And because they are drinking more caffeine, they're also experiencing more anxiety. OK, so the third variable of a high pressure job could be the important variable and could be the one that's affecting both caffeine and anxiety. But we don't know. OK, so there's always this issue of an intervening variable. And then finally, you've got the problem that correlational research is very often misused and misinterpreted. OK, so remember, correlational research only shows us relationships, OK, and whether or not they exist and how strong they are. Very often these relationships, however, are misquoted as facts and they're not facts. They're just associations. An example of that is research that found that people who grew up in single parent households are more likely to go on and commit crime. OK, now that doesn't mean that growing up in a single parent household makes you a criminal because there's a lot of other um, third party variables and intervening variables that exist there. OK, however, this relationship has in the past been misquoted as a fact when it's not. It's just a relationship. OK, so um, the results can very often be misquoted and misinterpreted, which is an issue. OK, just to finish off, then I've got a couple of exam questions for you and they're fairly standard for this type of topic. And they range from draw to interpret to explain and then evaluate. Obviously, this isn't every possible question, but this is kind of the flavor of questions that you're likely to come across. Draw the graph, obviously draw a scattergram. Um, with your two variables on each axis. Interpret the graph. So in this case, you've got a positive correlation between scores on a stress questionnaire and number of days off work through illness. Explain. That's a little bit tricky, but usually it revolves around the fact that doing an experiment um, isn't appropriate for one reason or another. Maybe it's unethical or maybe it's impractical, but um, it kind of always runs towards this idea that doing a correlation would be better for this particular um, for this particular area of interest. All right. And then evaluate is fairly standard uh, strength and weakness for four marks. So you can keep it fairly brief um, and just give um, a general idea of, you know, the pros and cons. All right. Obviously, there are other questions that can come up, but more often than not, there'll be a slight spin on this type of question. All right. Right. That is the end of the video. Try and get your hands on some exam questions so that you can practice this a little bit. Um, I hope it's all made sense and thank you very much for listening.